chapter 5, the Bible reads, And they came over into the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tomb a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus was far off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice, and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. There were about two thousand, and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see that it was what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil, and at the legion, sitting and clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil, and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And, behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet, and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him, and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse, when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him, and told him all the truth, and said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace, and behold thy plague. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house a certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and seeth the tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel, and <coughs> them that were with him, and entereth in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand, and said unto her, Talitha Kumi, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, Arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of twelve years. And they were astonished with a great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it, and commanded that something should be given her to me. Uh, let's buy our heads for a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this Sunday, for the people that are here and our visitors. Pray that you'll fill past with your spirit. Uh, help us get something out of this message. In Jesus' name, amen.
All right. Continuing our, continuing our chapter study here in Mark chapter 5. And again, I want to thank you all the visitors for being here today. And uh, it is a blessing. So Mark chapter 5, I don't have a title for it, but I'm sure when it hits, when it hits our YouTube channel, I'm sure we'll have something special. I'm looking for that. Anyways, so I've got three people here, um, three people that had been written off in this chapter, in this, you know, in this story, this context, three people who had been written off their conditions beyond repair. We find the maniac, the woman, and the daughter. And uh, we find these three people that society had written off. There's no help for them. There's nothing else they could do. And I'm glad that Jesus is someone who doesn't cast off when we say they're cast off. The Bible says, all that come to me, I will know why it's cast out. So I'm thankful there's never a time as a Christian that we can ever do something that God won't forgive, that God won't ever bring us back in fellowship. I'm thankful for us as Christians that he'll know why it's cast out. There's a lot of times family members, they'll cast out. Friends, they'll break friendships. Marriages end like never before. Con- it's not, I shouldn't say that because a lot of times people aren't even getting married anymore. They're just shacking up, you know. And we're finding that more and more in society where people are just truce breakers. They're covenant breakers. And those are some, we, we look at that in Romans chapter 1 and in 2 Timothy chapter 3 where it talks of perilous times that are coming. The time that I believe now is. And we see some of those symptoms as of the covenant breakers. They're truce breakers. They say one thing and they're doing another. Their, they're, you know, forwardness is in their, in their mouth and their lips and deceitful. And they're deceiving and continuing and being deceived. So I think it's it's rough looking at those different things going through uh, the world today and seeing how much it has an effect on our, on even in churches where we, we one minute we're covenant we we covenant together with churches we're we're part of a church and the next minute we're not we can't make church services so we know sometimes we we um, we're, we're here but we're not here and that's coming from my even my aspect. You know, I know working a job, it's hard, isn't it? I mean, you come home, you're just dragging, you've given your best at work, and you come to church, and you're just like, oh. And sometimes the world gets you kicking in your ribs, and you're just literally, you crawl to church on your hands and knees. Just, Lord, I'm coming. I'm coming to the church. I'm coming where I'm supposed to be among believers. And it's just, you're out of pure exhaustion, physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, all these different emotions. School, the same thing, right? We're doing our best to come. I'm just thankful you are here today. I'm thankful we all got here crawling on hands and knees, the world kicking us in the ribs, busting upside the head, and we're here. And I'm hoping you're here today to receive a blessing. But some people are so flippant that they're, 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 not, in, they're not even focused to a church. They're not focused in their daily life. They're not focused to that at all. But this is some things, some people that society had dismissed. These are things that society had said, there is nothing good in them. There's nothing we find, re- that we find nothing um, in them that is salvageable. There's nothing good of these people. And even for the world to say that, there's nothing good in them. And we're just done. And they wash their hands to them. I'm glad that helpless doesn't mean hopeless. I'm glad that when the world says, there's no hope for this, there's no help for this person, and I can't help this person, I'm glad we still have hope. And Jesus is that hope. The maniac, we're looking at the first part here in chapter number 5. Of course, there's a parallel passage. But it says, And they came over against the other side of of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come... Out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him. No, not with chains. He was living among the graveyards. He was living among the dead. He was someone who was out there. He found himself living in the graves in, in, a, in a cemetery, and he was, in a sense, waiting to die. He was His whole life was surrounded by death. If I could look at someone in the Bible and say this guy probably had maybe golf in him, you know, some golf behavior, this guy had it. He was in the darkness. He was in the tombs, in and out, chained with chat with fetters. By the way, what is with the golf? I know this is back like 20 years too late, but what is with the golf out there? Always, you know, wearing pure black chains, necklaces, dog leashes, tattoos. Everything's going to be mournful and sad and terrible. It's just, why is that? It's because there's something... Within them, the world has said, 
you know what? You're helpless. There's no help for you. You're helpless. And when you try giving them a little bit of hope, it blows their mind. It blows their world. And the hope isn't that what they want is going to happen, but what God has for them can happen. I remember when we were when I was in Florida um, with my wife before we got married, and uh, I would go I would go out to the mall, mall a lot of times. I just was not made for the heat, and it's like nine hundred degrees in Central Florida, and I mean I would go outside and sweat. I'm like, this is why I don't uh, no, no no sweat if you're working yes, but if you're just going outside to open the front door no this no no something's wrong with that. But I remember going to the mall, air conditioned, walk around, and witnessing the people on the benches and stuff and passing out tracks the best way I could. And then sometimes it would just be you sit back and just watch people walk by. And back then, this is back in 2000, 2002, whatever, people are, well, these people would walk by and it looked like they had tripped and fallen down into a tackle box. And they had so many piercings all in their face. This is back when face piercings were the, you know, the, the cool thing. I don't know, but it's weird. And people had piercings in the most weirdest places possible. And they just walked around without any hope. And you tried giving a little hope, and they were still, they, but they chose that. They chose that in themselves. This guy was demon possessed. No man could tame him. No man could help him. I mean, could you imagine if he would, he went down to maybe the, you know, the local AA. You know, he went down to the AA, and they tried getting some help and, you know, steps of affirmation. And they couldn't even help him with serenity prayer. But they did their very best to help him out. And he wound up being just absolutely helpless. They couldn't help him. They went down to the Pentecostal church to lay hands on him. You know, they cast out the demon. And nothing happened. Nothing helped. They went down to everything they could go on to. They went to psychiatrists, psychiatrists, behavior health. They went to everyone they could possibly go to to get a little bit of help. And they couldn't find it. Their solutions? Bind him with fetters. Let's bind him with fetters. Let's tie him out to the woods. Let's put him out on a chain out in the middle of the catacombs. Let's put him out there in the tomb. Let's get rid of him out of society. There's no help for him. He was, he was, well, they found that their, their idea of taming him was with fetters and chains. The Bible says he was cutting himself and crying aloud day and night in the tombs. He was out there crying aloud and cutting themselves. Cutting himself. We can find that same demonic activity on Mount Carmel with Elijah, the prophets of Baal, and the people were up there cutting on themselves and trying to call upon Baal to save them. The same mentality, the same treatment. They're doing everything they could to just, he was trying his hardest to get whatever was in him out. He wanted it out. And maybe he could cut himself, maybe he'll, get, maybe he'll depart. But he found himself cutting and crying aloud, day and night, baying at the moon, if you would, if you could imagine that. Baying at the moon. I remember. Abigail is two, maybe three. I don't know if he's my daughter's in embarrass. I'm going to embarrass Abigail a lot today. So prepare yourself, Abigail. <laughs> I remember when Abigail was two, two, two or three, Don, a friend of ours, excuse me, <coughs> had given her ice cream and coffee. And it was like a grandpa, so you, you know, jack him up a little caffeine and sugar and turn him over to mom and dad. <coughs> And she looked up and she saw the moon and she started banging at the moon. Just going at it. And of course, he, Don put her up to it. But she was just beyond herself, just gone crazy. But howling at the moon day and night. Craziness. But this maniac, no man could help him. But I look at, I found this pretty interesting here. It says in verse number, verse number, um, verse number four, it says that the fetters and chains, and the chains have been plucked asunder by him. So even their attempts, their, it was supernatural strength, binding chains and fetters and breaking them loose and breaking in pieces, and no man contained them, so they cast him away. Can't do much with him. It's interesting they knew exactly where he was. The people in the town knew where he was, but couldn't find anything to do with him. It says in verse number 6, when we saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of David? Son of the Most High God. Excuse me. What do I do to thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? Excuse me. I adjure thee by God, that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. The demons came, and the demon-possessed man came and worshipped Jesus. That, that's pretty cool itself, right? This demon-possessed guy came and worshipped Jesus. 
that says a lot for people who are not demon possessed and refuse to worship Jesus. That says a lot for people who call themselves Christians but don't find the time to worship. They don't time to read their Bible. They don't come time for prayer. They don't put Christ first in their life. A demon possessed man has more sense than they do. When we don't put God first in our life, let's put it practical for a second. When we don't put God first in life, when we don't make him preeminent, we don't give him preeminence, I'm not saying we have to go and quit our jobs, leave our families, and go be a, some join some monastery monk. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is if we don't recognize and put God first in all that we do, at work, at school, at play, at everything we do, if we don't put God first and wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I'm putting God first in everything I do today. I'm going to wake up, I'm going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to live in the spirit, I'm not going to live in the flesh. I'm going to yield myself as servants of righteousness and not ministers of unrighteousness. I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God. Lord, I'm going to put you first in all that I am. Lord, control my mouth today. Lord, control my thoughts today. Control my ears today. Help me not to listen to the wrong things. Help me not to say the wrong things. Help me to only speak the things that bring honor and glory to you. If we don't do that first bit, if we don't come to that place in our life and we don't put God first... Every morning, we have less sense than a demon possessed man. That's practical. That's practical. God, now watch this. It says in verse number seven, this, 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 uh, made me stop and think pretty awesomely. I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. They recognize Jesus as being the Son of God, and therefore being equal to God. But he says here that they that God was adjured by God. He says, I'm adjuring you by God. The devils knew their end. The devils knew the timetable of when they're going to be defeated. The devils knew that all things were going to be subject under Christ's feet. It was going to happen in the end, but it was not now. And they're telling Jesus, they're adjuring, they're strongly urging or pleading, they're strongly urging or pleading God, by God, not to do something ahead of time. They're basically reminding, reminding God, your word is above you. And it's not your planning yet. It's not your time yet. You have to wait. God has given timetable of when he's going to defeat the armies of Satan the enemies of the enemy, the, the angels of, of, of Satan, when he's going to throw Satan out, he, you know, he's going to destroy Satan and destroy the world. And the devils knew that, and they look at God, they look at him and says, I'm adjuring you by God. I adjure thee by God. He says, It's not your time yet. It's almost like when we look at God and say, God, in your wrath, remember mercy, Lord. Or how about this one? We say this two letter word that's not really, you know, what about this? God forbid. Well, we tell God, Lord, forbid it. It's not time yet. It's not within your time scale yet to do these things. But I found it pretty interesting that God was adjured by God. And the devils adjured God by God. I mean, we have to believe that Jesus is God, right? And the Son of God is, is God. But he says, I adjure thee by God. I found that kind of interesting. And it's a lot more we bounce around your, your thoughts a while for, for a while. So there's a lot of times within yourself, if you check yourself, right? Check yourself. Don't, op don't you know, control yourself. Operate within what's true. Operate what we know is, is, is faculty. We try teaching this to the kids, right? They start getting worked up about something. Stop. Think about your actions. Stop and think about what you're doing before you do it, right? Collect your thoughts. Sit back. Don't act in haste. Haste makes waste. Think about what you're doing. That's basically the debt with the demons the, the, the devils here are telling Jesus, think about what you're about to do. The demons, notice this also, the demons had answered prayer. This is hopeful for all of us Christians, that if God answers the prayer of demons, he can probably answer ours too. Look what it says in verse number 7. And he cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought, that's asking, right, prayed, asking, besought him much, that he would not send them away out of the country. 
Now there were nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, and, and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. Jesus answered their requests. So here's the thing, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit tonight with prayer, but if Jesus answers the demon's prayer, what the demons asked of him, what makes you think that Jesus won't, ask, he won't give us what we ask of him? The Bible says he'll give us all things in his name according to his will, right? If we ask him according to his will, he hears us. So if we're not asked, if, you know, John Rice wrote a book, he preached a sermon, wrote a book, ask prayer, asking and receiving. If we don't simply ask, we'll never simply receive. All things are there, right? God is willing to answer our prayer. We just have to ask him. But here you find that. I want to point this out as well, moving on quickly. The community had thought more of the hogs than of the humans. They knew where this demon-possessed guy was, and they couldn't help him. They couldn't bring him hope. They tried tying him with the fetters and chains. They tried tying him with, with fetters and, and chains, and they broke him asunder. And he was out there in the middle, in the, in the middle of, the, of the mountains and the tombs, day and night, crying and cutting himself with stones. He was a problem to society. They didn't want him in their sight. He was frustrating. He was annoying. But then even after he cast out the demons... They were more concerned about the swine than they were about the man who had been saved, the man who had been healed, the man who had the demons cast out of him. Look what it says in verse number 14. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that was done. And they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid and they, and they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed of the devil, and also concerning the swine, and they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. I mean, these people, first of all, it was unscriptural, it was unholy, it was, it was ill-advised, it was against the law, the law, the law of Moses, to even have pigs. It was an unclean animal. But these people found a way to be better pig farmers. You know, maybe because it wasn't actually in the city, we can put it out in the country where things don't happen, things in the country stay in the country. But we're going to go ahead and put it out there. We're going to have a bunch of swine. We're going to have a bunch of pigs. And they were going hog wild with this farming idea of raising pigs. And um, hog wild? No? They were like living high in the hog. And they were having their bacon and eating it too. And they were here, here they out there. And they're raising a bunch of hogs, pig farmers. You know, one thing I can tell you about being around the Amish a lot, there's two smells, there's three smells, and I'm four. There's four, five. There's five smells in Amish country that no one can deny. Number one, shorts and shrivers. They don't take baths. Number two, <laughs> they don't take the baths. They're not regular on bath taking. Number two, horse poo. Fresh horse poo, you know it's horse poo. Number three, cow manure in the field. You know it's out there when they're spreading that fertilizer. They had everything reached. Number four, chicken factory. Case farms, you drive by it. Anywhere in Winesburg, you know you're in Winesburg. It stinks to high heavens. You know you've been there. But number five, the most atrocious smell I've ever, ever smelled outside of my brother's armpits while wrestling. Number five had to have been the pig farm. The smell of the urine and the stench, and it was just like, oh, it was overwhelming. It was just, uh, it's amazing that something so filthy could taste so good. But it was just the nastiest thing in the world to smell. But those five things, learning in Amish country, those five things. Number six, close six, is, is, the, dog, is the, dog, the dog food company. We're making dog food. That's pretty reeky as well. You get there at some points, but I tell you what, you wish you had brought something for your nose, but that's pretty bad. But those are some things I can tell you about. But here these people lived in the hog farms, and they're living high in, the, you know, high in the hog out there. But the community thought more of the hogs than of humans. They took the unclean animal, and they promoted it as being their livelihood. In so much, they asked Jesus to get to leave. They asked Jesus to leave. Could you imagine that? Jesus shows up, works a miracle, changes that one guy in society that everybody knows he's there, and then they don't like it, and they ask Jesus to leave. The maniac was helpless. 
but he wasn't hopeless. And as he wanted to get on the ship and go with Jesus to the next town, Jesus didn't say, you know what, come out with me, we'll go and move to this area, move everywhere I go. Jesus told him, no, 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 go back to your friends and your family and tell them what great things Jesus has done for you. And then he went out and began to publish it. But, you know, God doesn't always want Jesus. There's a time where Jesus is going to gather all of his believers together into one group gathering. There's going to come a time when he does that. But it's not now. So our job is to, is to remain steadfast and faithful and be the salt and light where we're supposed to be. Being the witness. Witnessing at work. Witnessing at school. Soul winning. Doing all those things that God would have us to do. Let's quickly look at this, this case of this woman. Now, we don't know her name. And of course, it's wrapped in the story here of Jairus' of daughter. And it says here in verse number, uh, verse number 24. So he's, going, he's on his way to Jairus' daughter, to Jairus' house, to take care of his daughter. And as Jesus, and Jesus went with him, and much people followed him, and thronged him, and a certain woman which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind, and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And of course, you know the rest of the story. They're kind of mocking Christ, saying, Hey, what do you mean? All these people are bumping into you, and you're like, Who bumped you? Like, really? Everybody's everybody's bumping into you. What, what, do you. what do you mean, like, who touched my clothes? Like, kind of like laughing at it a little bit. But I want to quickly go and read this, go through here quickly because I'm running out of time. But num there's 12 years this woman had, had dealt with an issue of blood. She was unclean, she was unhelped, and she was unlawful. The Bible says in Leviticus chapter number 15, verses 19 and verse 25, the Bible says that if a woman had seven days of purification when had, with the issue of blood. And if she was not clean after that, she was supposed to be, you know, she had that time, she was supposed to be put out for seven days without the camp, kind of being separated. Uh, if I could say it this way, social distancing, quarantined from society for seven for seven days. And after that, she was going to be pure, just had to bring hope, you know, bring peace offering, to, you know, peace offering to the Lord to kind of like be purified, you know, to show that she had been purified. For 12 years, this woman was unlawful. For 12 years, this woman had, had tried everything that she could. She went to the doctor, and the doctor says, I'm sorry, I can't help you. And then she went to another doctor, and she says, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't help you. And soon all of her wages, all of her money had been wasted, and instead of getting better, they made it worse. Well, I can't actually say this actually works. It's been untested and proven, but we're going to go ahead, and the studies haven't been verified but I'm going to have you take this vaccine or take this shot, let's take this little bit of poison, put it in your body, and see if this will actually help you. We're not, it's not for sure, but we understand you have this plague. You've got this, you've got this outbreak. You've got this whatever it is. We can't say for sure what it is, but we haven't proven it in tests. We haven't proven it in any laboratory this is actually going to work. We're not sure exactly what's going to happen, but if you take this little bit of poison and add it to your body, we think it might help. And the Bible says they made it worse. And it's dealing with a plague, and it made it worse. Where she should have been quarantined from society, she wasn't, and she made, and it made the matter worse. Man, I'm reminding you of something, but I can't quite think of what it is. But I would almost think that it would be almost like at a pandemic level. But I can't think of what I'm thinking of, so let me keep on going. Notice in her mindset the low self-esteem that she had. Well, everyone else is around. And I, there's a difference between low self-esteem and humility. There's a difference between having humility and having low self-esteem. If you're constantly abasing yourself, you don't have basing yourself, making fun of yourself, deriding yourself, putting yourself down publicly. You, it's not that you have humility. You've got low self-esteem. And you're still thinking of yourself more than you ought to. 
I have I have a problem with low self esteem at times. I seriously ride myself down. I pick on myself. I belittle myself, which takes great effort. But I you know but I do all these different things and I and I and it's, and it's a false flag of humility. Humility isn't putting yourself down. Humility is humbling yourself and exalting Christ. Low self esteem still puts you at the center of one's attention. But this woman here, she wouldn't even get with Christ at shoulder, at elbow level. Here Jesus is rubbing shoulders, bumping elbows with all these people in the throng. Could you imagine trying to get through this throng? throng? We have some more visitors from First Baptist in Hammond that had been there at any time. So I grew up for 18 months at First Baptist Hammond. Pastor Howells was my pastor briefly. I remember one day in Sunday school, I was getting sick. I had a stomach bug, and my parents kept me from being in Sunday school and had me in this adult Sunday school class in the actual auditorium, in the old auditorium. And um, I remember getting sick, and I think I told this story before, but I remember like trying to get through the masses, trying to get up to the bathroom where you come out the lobby, and here's like the lobby this way, and the choir room, the bookstores back this alleyway. You know what I'm talking about, the main aisle that way. And um, if, if you still go to that old auditorium, I guarantee you, unless they've replaced carpet, you will still smell what happened to me at that spot. And I remember I was trying to get through, and people were like, no, we're not going to go through. we got to be the first ones in the front row. we got to be the seen by Pastor Hiles. We're trying, you know, all these students are pressing and pressing, and we're trying to get out, and they want to let me through. My dad's like, make hole, make a way. you got to get to the bathroom. Excuse me. No, 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 go around, go around. And I'm like, Wah! And I threw up everywhere, all of a sudden, like, you know, Moses pardon the Red Sea. <laughs> and I went out through. And I still remember that most embarrassing, probably one of the most embarrassing things in my life happened there. Outside of being pushed down the stairs in the back hallway. But, um, but I remember, I remember, like, could you imagine everybody just being shoulder to shoulder, trying to get through the press? The Bible says they thronged him, they followed him, and he's trying to get through the press. Nobody's kind of gathering around. He's just trying to get through to to Jairus' house. And a woman doesn't reach out and touch Jesus' shoulder. Doesn't reach out and touch Jesus' shoulder. Doesn't reach out to touch Jesus' stomach, chest, back. She reaches out and she says, if I can just reach the hem of his garment. Where do you think the hem is? It's kind of down towards the feet. If I could just reach the hem of his garment. She didn't consider herself worthy to even bump, rub shoulders with Christ. If I can just get a little bit of of his clothes, just as he passes by, I'm not worthy. I'm not even worthy of that. But if I could just touch the hem of his garment. I'm not saying if I could grab hold of it, cut off a piece, use it as a prayer cloth and sell it on TBN. Uh, he says, if I could just, literally, if I could just get a touch, just a touch of his garment, I'll be made whole. If I could just touch the hem of his garment. What great faith. There's fractional faith. If I can just touch the hem of his garment. I mean, she didn't go up and grab anything. If I could just touch the hem of his garment. If we would just use that just that same slight, tiny bit of faith, the faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, and reach out. While everyone else is rubbing shoulders, she touched the hem. The prayer of the weakest saint moves the heart of God. I, I protest that to say this. The faith of the weakest saint moves the heart of God. The faith that we must have asking and believing. Little faith is faith enough. And she was made clean. She was made whole. Number last. <clears throat> Number last. That's right. The daughter. Plagued. She was also plagued. There's no social distancing required. We're not too sure exactly what was going on with her. She was sick. But it says that she was sick and the, and the daughter lies at the point of death. And it says that, um, it says in verse 23, he besought him greatly. My daughter lieth at the point of death. And as, she's, and as he's on his way, as he's speaking that way, there comes verse number 35. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, certain which said, thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? 
And as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. Social distancing existed before, that was part of the other part. Then you'll, I'll, I'll get to this main point here. There's different kinds of reactions to death. There are different kinds of reactions to death. Number one, unsympathetic. You're going to come across some people and they're unsympathetic towards death. Yeah, well, they got what they wanted. They got what they deserved. Or, you know, we'll make YouTube videos and we'll celebrate Osama about, you know, um, not Osama bin Laden. Well, him too, but uh, what was the guy? Um, Saddam Hussein. We'll celebrate his death. We'll make videos about his hanging. We'll rejoice in someone being put to death. Publicly put to death. Rejoicing in that someone was put to death. After all, they're enemies of the state. They deserve to get that. But really, the Bible says rejoice, don't your enemy faileth. But look how many people got up and just celebrated and danced in the streets and made great big proclamation because they died. Ding dong, the witch is dead. The wicked witch is dead. Hey, happy new, happy new year. Great, wonderful. But what about being sympathetic? She is dead. And the attitude was this. Look at look at verse number look at verse number thirty five. Look at the, uns, the 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 lack of sympathy, unsympathetic people in his life. Thy daughter is dead. Why trouble thou the master any further? Hey, you know what? Why are you bothering Jesus? She's dead. He didn't know this. My daughter's at the point of death. She's sick. She's dying. Jesus, come and take care of my daughter. As he's coming, hey, Jairus, your daughter's dead. Dead on the doornail. Groundhogs are bringing their mail. She's dead. Start picking out caskets. Stop bothering Jesus. She's dead. Wow. Do not hire him, Hallmark. This guy had no sympathy. This guy had no care or compassion in him at all. But this is a reaction that people have towards death. There's no sympathy. We ought to be sympathetic people. Jesus cared for the people. Jesus cared upon John the Baptist's death. The Bible says Jesus looked upon the multitude and he was moved with compassion. This is after John the Baptist, who had been a leader, who had been a people, came out and were followed John the Baptist in, gro in droves, 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 deep, droves came out in droves to the water to be baptized of John. They followed Jesus. They were disciples of Jesus, disciples of John. And they come to him and they're just they're lost. They're distraught. There is no more leader. They're sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus is moved with compassion on them as sheep having no shepherd. Their leader was gone. Where's the sympathy? We as Christians ought to be people known for sympathy, for compassion. Number 38. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and seeth the tumult, and they and them that we wept and wailed greatly. There are some people, they are just, they weep and wail greatly. There are some people who are professional mourners. I never thought I'd see that in my lifetime. I remember when my mom died, and this guy that I worked with, and i being gracious when I call him a guy because he was actually a flat out flamer. This guy. Heard my mom died, never met my mom, decided to weep and cry, take the day off when my mom died because he just felt so bad for me. I'm like, really? Like, you didn't know me. You don't even know my, my mom. And you're like, he was a professional mourner. He goes around, oh, yeah, I'm going to make me some chest pie. I'm going to make a chest pie for the funeral. Like, we never even had your chest. Just go away. Like, it's, it's, it's a time of mourning. I don't need a professional mourner. And these people never met him before. They're being paid to weep and wail and trail behind coffins. I never thought I'd ever hear this before. But there's people who are actually paid mourners to go and weep and wail. Ooh! And I never thought I'd see that in my entire life. But here, these people were weeping and wailing. And uncontrollably, they were just the tumult. There is this flat out weeping and wailing. And there's some people that are unrestrained. Yeah, death is tragic, but the weeping and wailing going out and shaking the coffin. Have you been to a funeral and seeing that? They're just sitting there shaking the coffin. Well, <laughs> unrestrained. But look at verse number 38. It says this. Verse, sorry, verse 30, 39. This is why I believe they weren't sincere. Verse 39. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. The Verse number 40. And they, what? laughed him to scorn. 
they weren't sincere in their weeping. That wasn't sincere. There was dramatics. That's pretty rough stuff. Anyway, the last point here is the unbelievers. There are those people who also scorn the hopeful. You know what? So-and-so died. I'll use Pastor Carpenter, for example. Dear friend of mine, I would say there's three people in my life that I give as spiritual, spiritual influences that I have in my life. And he was one of them. He was one of the people that I would go to, and if I had a question, if I had something I was going through, if I had a personal prayer request, a personal battle, he was one of the few people I would go to and share with him that I was 100% pure, vulnerable. He had veto power. On he, he was one of the people had, that, had, that had like strong veto power in my life. He was one of the very few people that I had in my life that I said, you know what, help me make, you know, don't make me go down the wrong path. Let me not do those stupid things. I'm putting my, I'm trusting you. I am putting my confidence that you're going to give me good advice. He was one of my counselors. So he wasn't somebody I can easily replace, you know. I'm sorrowful that this guy died. I'm thankful he's in heaven. In the Facebook chat, there's some people are saying, you know, he's, you know, he's, there's no brain, you no know, high brain activity. Um, the doctors are giving him hope. They've taken him off the respirator. They've given him hope. It's just a matter of time, keeping him sedated and letting him be comfortable as he passes. And someone got up there. In Jesus' name, I rebuke this disease. I rebuke the infection. I pray, Lord, you'd quicken his brain and make alive. And I'm like, that is a person who is unbelieving and unsupportive to the hopeful. The hopeful is that his death would be precious in the sight of God, that God would give him perfect peace, that God would give him a, a, a painless, a painless and undramatic, a peaceful crossing from from this death unto you know that life in heaven. We know he's already there in heavenly places, but they were so dramatic towards that. And when he died. They started flailing off. Yeah, I wonder if he was even saved because God would never... I'm like, really? It was probably some friend of a friend of a friend of a friend, but it was like such dramatic nonsense. But unbelievers will often scorn the hopeful. They're the, they're the ones you get up and talk about, hey, well, at least they're in heaven. Well, you know, how do, can we know for sure anybody's in heaven? Can we ever really know? Well, did he, did he, did he truly repent of all of his sin? Did he truly believe... There must be some sin in his life or else he wouldn't have got this dreaded virus or dreaded disease. Or There's, there's always those people that cause that unhopeful and that they scorn the hopeful. The Bible tells us that Jesus put them out. Jesus got rid of the negativity and the naysayers. They need to be shunned. Nothing can be done when nothing can ever be done when negativity and naysayers are around. The Bible says it this way in Proverbs 22. Cast out the scorner and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. Sometimes the scorner's got to be kicked out and would have forgot to do anything. And then Jesus rises her up, 12 years old. Now, the Jer 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 12, his 12-year-old daughter was just seemingly pronounced dead. My daughter Abigail's 11. 11 and a half, she's turning 12. I can't imagine what Jerias is going through. And he's coming by the way, trying to get to Jesus. Jesus, heal my daughter. And he's trying to get to Jesus. He gets held up by this woman with an issue of blood. And he looks at her like, dude, wait, or sorry, do that. Like, seriously, like, wait your place and turn. I went and got Jesus. I waited the line to get Jesus. I'm taking Jesus with me. Why are you holding him up? If this woman hadn't stopped Jesus, my daughter would still be alive. And you can imagine the turmoil and the, the frustration in his heart. And as he's going to Jairus' house, this one comes out and says, Dude, your daughter's dead. Stop bothering Jesus. Jesus, you can go on, take your leave. Daughter's dead. You're too late. You missed it. Jesus stops, looks at Jairus and says, Be not afraid. Only believe. Be not afraid. Believe. Don't be afraid. Don't listen to this hush. Don't worry about the people bumping into you. Don't worry about the throng, people trying to get names and numbers and Facebook friends. Don't ignore all this. He looks at Jairus and says, Be not afraid. Only believe. What great peace Jesus spoke to Jairus. And he gets there and he sees the tumult. He dismisses him out. 
He keeps Peter, James, and John in the room. Everybody else takes kicked out. Jesus looks at him and says, Daughter, arise. And she gets up. Could you imagine the peace and the knowledge and the assurance and the, just the great understanding, the great appreciation that Jer- Jerias had towards Christ, that nothing that had happened along the way stopped Christ from doing what he said he was going to do. Help and bring hope. When people said it's no longer needed, she's dead, she's helpless, she wasn't hopeless. When the people of the maniac of Gadara said, you know what, you're helpless, there's nothing we can do, he wasn't hopeless. The woman with the issue of blood that spent everything that she had, aren't you glad that she wasn't, although she was helpless, she wasn't hopeless. No matter what your problem is today, aren't you glad that you're not You may seem helpless, but you're not hopeless. Grateful. I'm glad. And you know what? Be not afraid. Only believe. Only believe. Let's pray.